This is the word of God. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not be conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burden, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in, him, will be in, in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Let the one who is taught the word sh share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. This is the word of God. So we are back to our Galatians series, and it's been a while, I know, and last time, if you remember, we were looking at the full fruit of the Holy Spirit, right? And the command at the time was this, live by the Spirit, live by the Spirit. Do not live by the desire of the flesh, but live by the desire of the Holy Spirit. Follow the desire of the Holy Spirit. So its conclusion is actually, you can see in our text, beginning of our verse 25 right there, if... Look at verse 25. If or since we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. And now here at the beginning of our text in chapter 5, verse 25 and 6, you will see two letters. Do you see that? Now, if you do Greek and they do parsing, then the verbs they see right there is a subjunctive, first person, plural. So us, let us, so and so. Let us, so and so, that's what, is, what we have right here. And actually one is positive and the other is negative. Let us, let us not, in that sense. So the focus is us, as a community of believers, as a church, us. So what is in view here is not just individual, personal, spiritual life, you, yourself alone, no, but as a together, as a community. So twice it says, let us, us, plural, us together. Now, the first one let us, it says, verse 25, keep in step with the Spirit. Now, the verb that is used right there is stoikomen in Greek, stoikomen. This is a language used in the military context, that you walk in step, Together, keeping the formation in line. Have you ever watched like news through news of like North Korea, for example, military marching? You know how they march, these all the army soldiers, and, and even though they are a group of people, they march, they left and right, left, right, like a one person moving. <laughs> and then moving forward, keeping the perfect line and formations, like looking at it like this, all right? Yeah, have you ever seen that on the news? Or you probably seen in a movie, like, you know, Roman army or the Greek military groups, they march together, uh, their feet at the same time moving forward, keeping the formation, following the commander, according to the rank, they stand and they march. Actually, that's the picture we get here in that word. Paul says, we, let us, walk together, in step together, following the commander, the Holy Spirit. Keep in step. It's one body. So, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is not just about your individual, inner, personal experience. Yes, it is, but it's not only that, but also communal communal fruit that we bear together through the means of grace, the word of God, prayer and sacraments and all in the Holy Spirit as we move together, we bear those together. And verse 26, 
there is also another lettuce that is this time negative lettuce now in the following verse. Verse 26, let us not become conceited, provoking one another and being one another. Some people think that this verse should be actually part of chapter 6 because it is connected to what's going to come in the next chapter, chapter 6 contents. And I can see why. But at the same time, you can see why this is kind of included in the division of chapter 5 because this is connected to that as well. But, you know, the original manuscript of the Bible did not have a chapter division. So, But this is connecting this chapter 5 and 2, this verse. As a community of faith, let us walk together with spirit, but let us not be considered. What does that mean, considered? Now, the word considered right here in Greek is kenodoxoi. Doxo means, you know, we used to sing the song doxology at the beginning of a worship. Doxology, it means glory, glorifying God, glory. Keno means empty, foolish, worthless, or vain. So kenodoxo, it means seeking worthless or vain glories, empty glories. So let's not seek empty, vain glories. That's what let's not be considered means. Now, how does one seek vain glories? And Paul explains that with the following two parties right there. Not provoking one another, not envying one another. Provoking and envying. Let me explain those two. Provoking comes out of the sense of superiority by giving the impression that I am better than you. You provoking other people, hey, I'm right. I'm better. I know. I'm more righteous than you are. I'm more spiritual than you are. So that person is seeking vain glories, exalting the himself or herself by putting other people down. I'm better. That's provoking. On the other side, other people or some people chasing after these vain glories by envying others. Now, this time, this one comes out of the sense of, sense of inferiority, envying other people. Now, you are seeking temporal, vain, earthly glory, glories from the people and not finding your identity, not finding your own self-worth in Christ, even though Christ Jesus already defined you, the king of the whole universe has already gave you your worth, your identity, and you're not settling with that. You're trying to seek your worth and your identity from the people by envying other people. So, it is possible that someone in a church can seek relationships, and only this kind of relationship, that one is what's going to make me feel better about myself through that person. Building a relationship, try to build a relationship for this purpose. Even at the expenses of other people, I can, if I can show off, I'm great, I'm better, I'm good. Rather than seeking the good of the other people, it's all about me. Or on the other side, out of envy, Always approaching a relationship with a calculation of what can I get from this person? How this person can benefit me? Can give me that I do not have? Can I be like that? And you're just envying. You want to be like it. Almost as if, you know, when little kids looking at the so-called cool kids at school, oh, I want to be like, I want to be different. I want to be associated with them. So, oh. So I can be like, hey, I'm cool too. I want, they're always seeking a relationship in that sense. Even the king of the glory has, hey, this is who you are. This is your worth. And it's like, no, you're looking at seeking vain glories from other people. For both of them, you know what? They value relationship in terms of your life for me. While Jesus was my life for you. These people are always, you, how can you, me, your life for me. But Jesus was my life for you, for your restoration, for your healing, for your gain, for your good, for your healing and freedom in your life. Jesus was at my expenses for your sake. 
Now, I believe our youth group teachers and children's teachers who are serving there, they do not approach the relationship to the little children and say, oh, through them, how I can show off I'm good, how good I am. Nor, oh, I want to be like, no, like my life, I'm laboring, I'm working, my life for you, my life for you. Not like, oh, what can I get from them? All right? And that's got to be the actually the relationship even here in the church. My life for you. And I hope it is so with our leadership in every relationship, approaching each other with this intention after Christ. So I'm asking you, how do you approach relationship within a church? What kind of relationship do you seek? Many people do go for church hopping, or should I say church haunting, seeking for a community and relationship. They can make them feel better about themselves. Well, are these people going to make me feel like important? So they lose Christ-like relationship, my life for you, but they often seek vain glories. For some people, so it is an endless search. For years and years, they keep just searching for a church, and they can hardly can settle in a one church for a long period of time. And relationship in the church is just always consuming, just consuming. Now think with me. Why Paul talks about this right after he talks about the fruit of the Holy Spirit? I mean, previously in chapter 5, Paul says there are two desires within us, the desire of the flesh and desire of the Holy Spirit, and they are at war against each other. And if we live by the desire of the flesh, then you will get the fruit of the flesh. And actually, Paul gave us a list of the fruit of the flesh. If you look at chapter 5, verse 19 through verse 21, right? Now, would you look at those lists again? Chapter 5, verse 19 to 21, right there. And you will see many of them in the fruit of the flesh, many of them is not just about yourself within you your own, within your heart, within your mind and soul experience, but they are very relational fruits, such as enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, rivalry, dissension, division, envy. It impacts your relationship. So if you live by the desire of the flesh, it is not just something you experience within all. It impacts your relationships. So just like that, with the fruit of the Holy Spirit too. Look at the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It is not just only you experience within yourself, within your soul, or between God and you in the vertical relationship, but it also impacts your horizontal relationship. And look at that. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are very relational fruits. So if you live by the Holy Spirit, He will impact and change and transform not only within you, but your relationship. Don't you see that? A person who is filled with the Holy Spirit, suddenly, like when you feel like, if when you love the Lord, you know what? You will experience that you will love His people. Suddenly people right here seem so beautiful and loving me. I love these people. I care for them. That, that impacts your relationships with the fellow believers. So, Paul says, you understand this? Then let us, and let us know. Now, and Paul is giving us an example what this would be like. In verse 1 of chapter 6, Look at verse 1. It will be on the screen. It will be on the screen. And look at verse 1. This is my, my own literal translation of the Greek text. I try to translate this literally in, in English from Greek text. And it would be something like this. Brothers, if one may detect a man in some trespass, you who are spiritual, restore. And I put imperative plural. So restore is not just individual singular form, but it is a, all, you all, 
do this. It's a command, imperative command. Such a person in the spirit of gentleness, or it can be also translated as meekness, looking out for yourself that you may not be, you may not be tempted. So if someone sins, somebody did wrong. Now the fleshly desire, the response, will be what? Gossip. Did you hear that? So and so did this. He was like that. She was like that. Or slandering the person. Or prideful response. Oh, how better and righteous you are that you are not like that person in comparison. Oh, I will never do that. I will never be like that. Oh, no way. Or especially if the sin was done against you to you, the fleshly response will be seeking for revenge. I get back. Or anger. Or try to destroy the person. And midi. But Paul says, you who are spiritual here, in other words, you who live by the Spirit, you should do what? One, number one, restore him. Restore him. Now, once again, it is done in imperative plural. It is not just only few people's job. It is not only the pastors or some leaders' job. You all, church believers, can you get involved and try to restore the person together? Not gossiping, not slandering, not destroying the person. And that is love, joy, peace, love. Two, do it in gentleness, meekness. As you have heard many times in this church before, the Bible teaches us, speak truth in love. Speaking truth is necessary in order to restore that person to the right path. Not just say, oh, it is okay, it is okay to live in there. No, you got to speak the truth. Hey, no, that is wrong. You got to come. But in love, it's got to be done lovingly in such gentleness and meekness. And that's the word we saw, exactly the same word we saw in the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And three, Paul teaches us to do it in humility and fear. Paul attached that phrase right there. Watch out for yourself. So that you may not be tempted to. In other words, you acknowledge, you know that you are not better. You can fall into the same thing. You can commit the same sin. Oh, I'm, I'm not like that. No, you watch out too. You can be tempted to and fall into that. And furthermore, verse 3, if you look at verse 3, Paul says, don't be arrogant. Or being puffed up, thinking highly of yourself than you actually are. Oh, I will never be like that. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't think about yourself that way. So such humility and godly and healthy fear, oh, if I don't care for baby, is necessary. So let there be love, gentleness, meekness, humility, healthy, godly fear. And also Paul says, Show kindness. Paul goes on in verse 2. Look at verse 2, chapter 6. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Actually, a large number of modern day Christians live with this attitude of let's not get involved in each other's life. You live your own life, you handle your own issues, your burdens, your problems. I will take care of and handle mine. No touch, no commitment, no environment, no thanks. You do, I do. And you know that. And partially this is a reason why so many people love to go to large church and remain anonymous. I don't want them to get involved. I don't want to get involved with them. Nope, I don't want to bear someone else's burden. I don't want to share that. No thanks. But Paul says, this is how we fulfill the law of Christ. Some may think, but Billy, I already have a lot on my plate. Enough my burden for myself. I cannot look out for other people. 
I hear this. This is a beauty and the wisdom of your shepherd placing in a community of faith, your brothers, your sisters, your family. Let me try to unpack this in this way. This is interesting. This is what has been interesting to me. Look at the text. Look at verse 2 again. Did you notice this? Verse 2 says, bear one another's burden, right? And go a little further, verse 5. And he says, each one bear to bear his own. What? Now verse 2, he says, bear other people's burden. And verse 5 says, you bear your own. So it sounds like a contradiction. So which one is it? In verse 2, the Greek word used there, burden, is barus. It refers to heavy cargo, like really heavy load, big burden, a weight that one person cannot handle. But the other word used in verse 5, if I put the Greek alphabet into the English literal translation of English alphabet right there, Portian, and if I put it right there, and if I ask you, hey, can you read this? And you probably read the word in this way, portion. Your portion, your own individual responsibility. So the Bible commentators put it in this way. This refers to the, something like a one man's backpack that one can carry your own portion, your task, your responsibility. So Paul says, let each one handles their own responsibility, your own task. So Paul said many, many places of his letters, not only in Galatians, Paul warns about idleness. Don't be a burden to your brothers and sisters because of your laziness. Oh, you know, I'm not working. Can you guys somehow help me? Don't be like that. Out of your idleness, your laziness. But when you happen to have burden that one cannot carry by his own or her own, now you have your fellow believers buried together. The word barrows right here, the big cargo, I think about something like, you know, you got, when you got to have move, big couch, and one of you, I don't know how strong you are, that you cannot carry by yourself. It's too much, too heavy for you. You need help. So you hold the one edge of the couch, and the other person hold the another, the other side of the edge of the couch. Now you can handle it. Now you can move it. Because each person only needs to share half of that weight. It's become much easier and manageable. <clears throat> Guess what? More people get involved with it. It becomes easier because each person one fourth one tenth if each person gotta only take care of a little bit of weight of that couch i mean you see even in the church youth and children ministry or so more people get involved it means it become much more easier more deacons and deaconess we have more the things that they need to do much more easier it is so so no question now listen to me no question that bearing one another's burden requires sacrifice. Because the weight that the other person is supposed to carry now fall on you. Bearing one another's burden is obviously carries means sacrifice. How can you help somebody to carry the couch without sharing the weight of the couch partially on you? It takes sacrifice. It always involves sacrifice. In order to relieve other people, give them rest, you sacrifice. And that is how we follow Christ. A life of sacrifice after Christ, you see? Actually, you look into this and you think about it. Doesn't it sound like what Christ has done for us? Restoring a sinner in such gentleness? And how he bore our burden. I mean, Christ Jesus did not even go, can we share our burden? You take some, I'll take some. No, he took the full weight of our sin, our burden on himself. And even now, 
You have your own life issues, problems, challenges. Christ, you just say, okay, you guys some handle it. No. Cast your burden, he calls, upon Jesus for he cares for you. Right? He carries. I'll carry yours. You help each other. This is a life living after Christ. Now, let me give you this. Then what is the price of such sacrificial life? Paul says, don't seek for vain glories, worthless glories, but seek this. Are you ready for it? I love this part. Are you ready for it? Because I was meditating on this, preparing this. This has been really encouraging to me. And I hope it is so for you too. Look at verse, let's go move on. Verse 6. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do you get this verse? Same thing. I, I was watching the first service. If anybody get this meaning of this verse and laughing or not, and nobody's laughing, here's the same thing too. You don't understand what this verse means, right? Since nobody's laughing right here. This is not the reason why I said this verse has been very encouraging to me. But because of what follows after that. But let me explain what six, verse 6 means. For those of you who are being taught with the word, which is you, you, you learning God's word, share all good things with the one who teaches. Hint, hint. <laughs> so, amen? amen? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Share all your good things with the one who teaches you God's word. You being taught? Share good things. Yay! But this is not the reason why I say this has been very encouraging to me. Actually, in my first reading of this text as I was preparing for this message, I thought this was a very odd turn of the text in its flow. Why Paul suddenly talks about this? Where is going with this? So, and I felt a little bit awkward and uncomfortable. Oh, do I need to talk about this? Like, you no, know, because it feels like, hey, share all the good things with the one who teaches you. I feel like I'm promoting myself. So I just move on. Let me move on to the next verse. And then look at verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Now, there is a spiritual law, my brothers and sisters, just like there is a natural law. Whatever you sow, that's what you will reap. If you sow good seed, you will get good fruit. If you sow apples, you will get apples, right? That's the law of the nature, the natural law. And do not think it's going to be different when it comes to the spiritual aspect. Now, this is taking us back to chapter 5 once again. You sow flesh, you follow after the fleshly desire, then you will reap the fleshly fruit, the fruit of the flesh, which is corruption, Paul says right here. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap the fruit of the Spirit. So it is very foolish if you expect that when you sow flesh, flesh, flesh in your life, but somehow you reap spirit, spiritual, spiritual thing in your life, oh, don't expect that. Very foolish of you. When you do not even pray, regardless, somehow, but you, your life is only about flesh, 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 but somehow God's going to give me spiritual, like somehow I feel with the spiritual things. Oh, don't deceive yourself. That's what Paul's saying. Do not think you can mock God. Is, oh, God's going to somehow bless me with spiritual things. No. Whatever you sow, that's what you will reap. And as I was meditating on this a little bit more, I realized that Paul is not just talking about you individual personal experience or between you and God in a holy zone, I mean vertical relationship. But the context here, remember? Is about the horizontal relationship here. And Paul applies the same principle in your relationships. Amen. Nobody's saying amen. The baby is saying amen. 
Look at verse, middle of the verse 8 and 9 again. Middle of verse 8. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap what? Eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Let's do good to each other. Remember the context here is about your relationship with others. Restore other people. Share, bear burden with one another. Let us do good to each other. Now what will be the price of this? Because that is where you must put your eyes on. You got to set your eyes on that. Let us not grow weary of doing good. In due season, we will reap. Reap what? Reap what? In due season, when time is up, we will reap what? Eternal life. <laughs> Verse 6 was not just about pastors. Initially, I was thinking so narrowly. You know what? It also means our Sunday school teachers. You know what? It also means you, pa you parents and all of you. Let's keep doing good to each other. But what will be the price of your labor? You students. You teachers. Your youth students eternal life is your price. Teachers, Sunday school teachers keep going there and sowing, sowing God's word. And in due time, they will reap the little ones eternal life. You parents, you do that to your children. In due time, you will reap their eternal life. That's why you will reap if you don't give up. And that is the aim. That's going to be the prize of your joy and your boast in Christ. Do not grow weary of doing that. Philippians chapter 2, verse 16 through 17, Paul says this, Holding fast, hold fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud of that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, for your faith. I am glad and rejoiced with you all. All staff and all leaders, servants, Elders, deacons, and deaconesses, and small group leaders, and praise team, and all members, and all believers, do not give up doing good to your brothers and sisters in the Lord. Sharing God's word, pointing each other to Christ, praying for one another, reminding of it to each other to the to each other the word of God, His promises. Remind each other about oh, your God is faithful; He's near to you. Comfort one another. Encourage one another. Continue to do that. Then in due season, if you don't give up, you will reap their eternal life. Yes, you don't save them. Jesus saves them. But guess what? Jesus saves them through you. Jesus keeps them in faith through you. You. Teachers, Jesus saved youth students through you. Christ Jesus does not need anything from you, church. But that's the life he wants you to live after him. My life for you, my friend. My life, not your life for me, my life for you, my brothers and sisters. Do not seek vain glories. Do not boast in vain glories. Somehow, like old days in the church, I try to be associated with rich people. Oh, I want to be. Do not seek after the vain glories. Do not let your relationship be all about what can I get? What are you going to do for me? But as Jesus did to you, my life for you. Parents and all the members in this church, even if you are not parents, because you are to minister one another, and you are to raise the next generation in faith, 
And you look at them and say to yourself in your own heart, and your brothers and sisters in your small group as well, even if my life is being poured out like a drink offering on the altar of God before my God, even if so, I will rejoice and be glad for your eternal life, for you to know him and be saved. And on that day, you being there, praising and worship God, being re- fully and completely restored, watching you will be my prize and my boast in Christ. That's the reason why Paul says, appreciate teachers, appreciate those who teach you God's word. Share good things with them. Appreciate them because they are sowing God's word, the word of eternal life in you. So, so, so each day a week for you try to rip your eternal life. Church, you see teachers today, both children and youth, encourage them. Appreciate them. Let me end with this. At the beginning of our text, remember, we saw two letters. One positive, one negative. Verse 25 and verse 26. So at the end of our text, we also again see two letters. Again, negative and positive this time too. And let me end with that. Let us not, negative, grow weary of doing good. And positive. Let us do good to everyone especially to your fellow brothers and sisters, as much as you have opportunity, then we will walk in the spirit of our God together. Can I add this? I don't have this in my manuscript, and this came to my mind as I was praying last night. Because this word came to my soul, sacrifice, and some of you may feel, oh, going to church every Sunday, getting involved in the ministry, serving whatever the area. I give, I'm, my family and I, we are giving up a lot. I'm giving up having a vacation, going somewhere, because every Sunday we try to come here, we try to do this, giving up, giving up, giving up. And guess what? Jesus' disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, we gave up this and that and family, friends and house and land and everything to follow you. And you know what Jesus says? <laughs> Not really. You did, but in a sense... If you gave up all those for me, you will receive hundredfold more, not only in this life, but in the age to come. And I pray that God may give you that faith. Oh, we gave up so many things. I mean, unlike, unlike my friends, family, yeah, we're not going vacations. We are, we're just here all the time. Eternally, you will enjoy and have hundred and thousand times more than what you gave up. Do you believe that? Cannot be compared what Christ has promised to you. Let's pray.